this evening for this service of choral evensong. A welcome to you if you are with us in the cathedral, welcome to you if you are with us online, and a very special welcome to our verger of 40 years, Robert Preston. He started working in this cathedral, I understand it, at the age of 19, and has been a faithful servant of this place ever since. He's going to be reading the lessons and saying a few words to us later in the service, but we offer him our heartfelt thanks and our congratulations on his years of service in and care for this place. We open our worship by singing hymn number 377. The psalm set for this evening is Psalm 46. We sit while the choir chant the psalm, standing again for the Gloria at the end.
The first lesson is written in the book of Samuel, chapter 24, beginning to read at verse 1. When Saul returned from following the Philistines, he was told, David is in the wilderness of Egwidi. Then Saul took 3,000 chosen men out of all Israel and went to look for David and his men in the direction of the rocks of the wild goats. He came to the sheepfolds beside the road, where there was a cave. And Saul went in to relieve himself. Now David and his men were sitting in the innermost parts of the cave. The men of David said to him, Here is the day of which the Lord said to you, I will give your enemy into your hand, and you shall do to him as it seems good to you. Then David sent and stealthily cut off a corner of Saul's cloak. Afterwards, David was stricken to the heart because he had cut off a corner of Saul's cloak. He said to his men, The Lord forbid that I should do this thing to my Lord, the Lord's anointed, to raise my hand against him, for he is the Lord's anointed. So David scolded his men severely and did not permit them to attack Saul. Then Saul got up and left the cave and went on his way. Afterwards, David also rose up and went out of the cave and called after Saul, My Lord the King! When Saul looked behind him, David bowed with his face to the ground and did obeisance. David said to Saul, Why do you listen to the words of those who say, David seeks to do you harm? This very day your eyes have seen how the Lord gave you into my hand in the cave, and some urged me to kill you. But I spared you, I said. I will not raise my hand against my Lord, for he is the Lord's anointed. See, my father, see the corner of your cloak in my hand, for by the fact that I cut off the corner of your cloak and did not kill you, you may know for certain that there is no wrong or treason in my hands. I have not sinned against you, though you are hunting me to take my life. May the Lord judge between me and you, May the Lord avenge me on you, but my hand shall not be against you. As the ancient prophet says, out of the wicked comes forth wickedness, but my hand shall not be against you. Against whom has the king of Israel come out? Whom do you pursue? A dead dog? A single flea? May the Lord therefore be judge and give sentence between me and you. May he see to it and plead my cause and vindicate me against you. When David had finished speaking these words to Saul, Saul said, Is that your voice, my son David? Saul lifted up his voice and wept. He said to David, You are more righteous than I, for you have repaid me good whereas I have repaid you evil. Here ends the first lesson.
The second lesson is written in the Gospel according to St Luke, chapter 14, going to read at verse 12. He said also to the one who had invited him, When you give a luncheon or a dinner, do not invite your friends or your brothers or your relatives or rich neighbours, in case they might invite you in return, and you'll be repaid. But when you give a banquet, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, and the blind, and you will be blessed, because they cannot repay you, for you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. One of the dinner guests, on hearing this, said to him, Blessed is anyone who will eat bread in the kingdom of God. Then Jesus said to him, Simon gave a great dinner and invited many. At the time for the dinner, he sent his slave to say to those who had been invited, Come for everything is ready now. But they all alike began to make excuses. The first said to him, I have bought a piece of land and I must go out and see it. Please accept my apologies. Another said, I have bought five yoke of oxen and I'm going to try them out. Please accept my apologies. Another said, I have just been married and therefore I cannot come. So the slave returned and reported this to his master. Then the owner of the house became angry and said to his slave, go out at once into the streets and lanes of the town and bring in the poor, the crippled, the blind and the lame. And the slave said, Sir, what you ordered has been done and there is still room. Then the master said to the slave, Go out into the roads and lanes and compel people to come in so that my house may be filled. For I tell you, None of those who were invited will taste my dinner. Here ends the second lesson.
I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven. In the right hand of God the Father Almighty, from thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the
This evening's anthem is by the 20th century English composer Herbert Hulls, a setting of Psalm 42, like as the heart desireth the water brooks, so longeth my soul after thee, O God.
now speak in the name of God, who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. There are certain types of services held in cathedrals that have a particular significance and importance in the life of the church, of the diocese, and indeed of the cathedral. And the ordinations that took place over the past couple of days are two such services. Here in this place, three women and six men were ordained deacon or priest. They were tremendous services, and I'm very grateful to everyone who made them such a joyous moment. Three women and six men, called by God, discerned by the church as laborers in the field to seek out the lost, the broken, the fearful, the confused, and walk with them, tending their wounds, nursing their hurts, and always, always drawing them closer to the love of Almighty God. We all have a tribe that we are part of, in a way, the church is a tribe, a gathering of mostly like-minded people. And we tend to stick in our lives to our tribe. But that's not what Jesus Christ commissions us to do or indeed to be. The banquet in the gospel reading earlier this evening is analogous to the great heavenly banquet, the one at which there is a chair ready with our name on it, if we want it. And the beauty and the challenge of this reading is found in the truth that there'll be very many people at that banquet in heaven who we might not expect to be there. The guest list to the banquet of the heavenly kingdom is a lot different to the guest list at many a feast in our lives, and certainly will look different to what the dinner guests of the parable expected. We are told, go out into the streets and bring in the poor, the crippled, the blind, and the lame. Now, the church really did this. The church universal would look a lot different. I saw this in action in my late teens when I worked as a volunteer in a homeless hostel in North London. I worked with the Missionaries of Charity, the Roman Catholic Order of Sisters founded by Mother Teresa. The sisters literally had nothing, and yet they had everything. What they truly believed in in their hearts really did show forth in their lives. They literally went out into the streets and brought in the poor, the crippled, the blind, and the lame. We worked with some of the most deprived and disadvantaged people I've ever come across. People who lived on the streets, under bridges, in derelict buildings, and in cardboard boxes. Every one of the sisters treated every one of those people who came to us for food, shelter, clothing, support and comfort, as if they were welcoming Jesus himself, as if they were welcoming each one of them as an honored and treasured guest to the banquet. Most of those we worked with had been shut out and discarded by society. And they had all been shut out by the church. That is, until a small group of committed nuns in white saris 
supported by volunteers, went and found them, literally at times washed them, clothed and fed them, and drew them closer to their place at the dinner table. This taught me two things that remain with me today. Unlike the honored guests of the parable who were just too busy to attend, I must never be too busy or too preoccupied that I miss and ignore the invitation of Jesus Christ to join in the banquet that he offers, the eternal banquet. And secondly, that I must remember always that I am privileged and that in that privilege, my duty is to try to intentionally wash, clothe, feed and welcome those who are far worse off than I am. I think it's too easy for the church, for us all, to become preoccupied that we end up walking past the homeless person sitting on the bench right in front of the cathedral. Yet that homeless person may be Christ himself. So where does this leave us? The stakes set out in the parable are high, but the calling is straightforward. And it's up to us to decide whether to listen to the voice of God, a voice that speaks in both our ears and our hearts. Do we truly believe that there is an invitation with our name on it, an invitation to the heavenly banquet? Or are we simply just too busy and too preoccupied to even notice the envelope that's come through the door? And are we as the church, the church universal and the church locally, going to go out of here and invite the most disadvantaged and excluded in, that they too may know that they too have an invitation to their place in God's family? and that there is a place set for them at God's heavenly banqueting table itself. In the name of the triune God, whose Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen. And so let us pray. In a world riven by war and violence, we pray for peace. Almighty God, bring all war <clears throat> to an end, that all may be safe and secure this night. Draw a veil of the peace that comes from your heart alone across the lands of Russia, Ukraine, South Sudan, and the very many parts of the world where there is active combat. Lord, in your mercy. In a world riven by hunger and thirst, we pray for a fair share. Almighty God, teach us to be generous with all that we have. Help those of us who do have, share with those who do not have. Lord, in your mercy. In a world riven by natural disaster, we pray for those affected by adverse weather and the climate crisis. Almighty God, we thank you that you have blessed us with the fruits of the earth. Instill in us a sense of urgency to reserve the damage already done 
to stop the damage that could be done and to treasure what we have been given for every generation to come. Lord, in your mercy. And in a world driven by selfishness, we pray for generosity. Almighty God, grow in us generous hearts, generous in thought, word, and action, generous towards each other and to the stranger in our midst. Instill in us a willingness to share, to seek out the lost and the lonely, to share the gospel of good news, and to pray for the salvation of all nations. Lord, in your mercy. Please join with me in the words of the grace. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. We stand to sing the final hymn, number 387. do please be seated. Thank you. It takes the whole people of God to build the kingdom of God and many of you here give so freely and willingly of your time and many of you have done so over uh, many years, decades and that is truly wonderful. Those of you who have been here a long time are like glue. You keep the place together and you hold the stories in your hearts and it's been tremendous uh, hearing from some of you who have been here a long time 
hearing of how things have been and hearing some of the stories from a long time ago, and I'm very grateful to you for that. We are giving thanks today for Robert's 40 years of faithful service, and Robert would just like to say uh, a few words. Robert. Thank you, Dean Salmon. Ladies and gentlemen, call scholars, organists, and the chapter. <clears throat> 40 years ago, I started work as a virgin. I was a very shy young man at the time, I was given a whole load of keys and had no idea what fitted where. The late Michael Cole was Dean's verger at the time, and he was very kind, showed me how to put the chalice out on the altar, while the sacristan, Sister Aina from the Epiphany House, did the rest. When the sacristans retired from working, the vergers took over. I needed the experience and laying out vestments, and now it comes second nature to me. When I was interviewed by the then Dean, David Sherlock, Canon Martin Thornton, Canon Philip Maddock, and Archdeacon Arnold Wood, I was told that it wasn't a question of a job, but as a vocation to Almighty God. I have treated it as so for the last 40 years. I have seen many changes during my time, four deans, four bishops, and the current one, and I think seven Archdeacons of Cornwall and Bodmin. The Cathedral Choir has changed since the late John Winter and Henry Doughty, who were in charge 40 years ago. I have lovely memories of them, and I'm sure they are thinking of me in heaven at this time. Who knows? I received a very poignant email from Mr Dean Emeritus, um, David Sherlock, who is the only one who is still alive of the old chapter. And he said that he remembered the day when I was interviewed looking for a job that would give him a good start in his working life, yet at the same time would feed his very obvious desire that it should reflect his Christian faith. With the right training, I thought, we could do something to satisfy both requirements, and the excellent backing from my vicar at the time, Canon George Steer, helped us to come to the right assessment. What a different person we now see, experienced, still keen to get things right, a bit knocked about by the realities of life, yet resilient enough to keep going, but fortunately still portraying something at that lad of 40 years ago. Every July, I dread saying goodbye to the call scholars and also the older members of the cathedral community who have died, and my line manager, Steve Rose, who has now moved to pass this new, and other members of staff. But as I come to terms with this, I will not let it get in the way of carrying on with my characteristic loyalty and enthusiasm. It is the deep respect, and I, I would like to, to um, repeat respect, that which I have for these people which saddens me, particularly when former lay assistants depart this world and other members of the congregation. I remember a lot of people with such fondness and love. In my memory, there have been amusing times, such as the cathedral cat called Riffy, belonging to the former head verge of the late Alan Heath. I looked after his two cats while he went on his holidays, and once I lost Riffy in the cathedral, he was asleep in the stone pulpit, woke up, stretched out on the podium, went to the wooden chairs, and sat for the mag near fear cat. Get it? <laughs> Also, he was spotted in the Christmas crib asleep in the hay amongst Jesus, Mary <coughs> and Joseph and the three wise men. <laughs> also in my memory, I have met many important people. Prince of Wales, Charles at the time in 1987, now King Charles III, Archbishop of Canterbury, Lord Runcie in 1987 and the late Diana, Princess of Wales in 1991 and the late Jill Dando, the former newsreader, and Mr. Michael Portillo in 2014, when he gave a talk of the railways in 1914 and transporting its troops. On the 27th of November, 2018, I had three days' notice to verge at St. Paul's Cathedral for the consecration of Bishop Philip Mount Stephen. This was a huge honour and privilege and a highlight of my career. I'd like to say a big thank you to you for all for coming and friends who are watching online. 
and I have been overwhelmed with people's kindness. Thank you all very much indeed. Well done. Well done. <laughs>